today, we'll be talking about political risk insurance, investing in emerging markets and developing countries, or not. Our speaker is uh, Maurice Starr. He's an EMPA candidate seeking to improve his financial analysis skills while here at Maxwell. Most recently, he served as head of business development and senior broker, specializing in international trade credit and political risk insurance with Plattus. He is particularly interested in learning public resource management, financial management skills, and ethics in public policy. After graduating from Maxwell, he intends to use his expertise to develop infrastructure in his native Senegal and other African countries. He holds a master's degree from Jean Moulin University of Lyon, received the aggregation in philosophy, and specialized in international risk management at ATC Paris. And we welcome Maurice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Hello, everybody. everybody. Two things. Uh, please interrupt me if I'm not speaking loud enough or if I'm speaking too fastly or anything. Uh, second thing, you can, of course, ask questions. I tried to make, to make the presentation quite short so that we can have time enough uh, later. But if you have any question at any moment, please interrupt. So uh, the objective of uh, this presentation is to provide a general view and understanding of the political risk insurance market. Uh, the political risk insurance market is not very well known, uh, yet it has a strong influence on many business decisions. And so what we are trying to do here is try to go into the, log the logic of what's happen happening there. So the first thing is that we will approach political risk insurance as an operational tool. So to do that, we'll uh, adopt the point of view of the, the initial risk holder, that be it a, a company, a private company, or financial institu institutions. And we'll try to, to weigh uh, the dilemma with, between risk taking and risk averting uh, when one takes a decision to invest uh, away from home, because usually uh, abroad operations are seen or perceived or anything are more risky uh, uh, than, uh, let's say, domestic operations. Uh, so first thing, uh, we'll try to go from the business risk in general to the political risk insurance principles. Uh, the first remark we can make is that uh, risk taking is something of the essence of business uh, because uh, it is because you take an operational risk or a risk of any kind that you can expect to have a return on, 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 on that risk. So, uh, but when we look at companies or banks or anything, we, we are surprised to see the amount of time, the amount of money they spend in managing those risks. Uh, at, uh, they do it to the point where we can uh, wonder whether risk taking is really what they do as a business. And so uh, when we try to go into political risk insurance, uh, one of, things, one of, of the things to consider is that ambivalence between risk taking and risk averting. So. Uh, there are multiple approaches to risk management. So, but basically we can make it into two parts. One part is that you retain the risk. The other one is that you transfer the risk. So you have several options in, in between, but basically at the end of the day, it comes down to taking the risk or transferring it. And either choice has important financial uh, consequences. Just to take uh, an example, for instance, if I have a, an export contract, a delivery contract, I can choose to contract and deliver it what, what they call free on board, which is that I bring my, I build whatever it is, uh, I construct it, and I build it up to the, point, the port in my own country. And after that, it's on to the buyer to, go, to come and take it. I can say, okay, no, I will deliver it to your place in, in the foreign country. I can say, no, I will not de deliver it only to the seaport, but I will deliver it to your premises. And maybe I will al also pay the insurance. So you can see that uh, depending on contractual options, 
uh, I am taking more and more risk, but those risks will have a financial implication because if I am delivering uh, free on board and the buyer has to come and take it and bring it away, I will not be charging the same price as if I were going up to his premises to, to deliver it. So there is a choice on the risk aspect and also on the financial uh, implications of, of, of each one. Well, when we talk about uh, risk transfer, meaning so the part of the portion of risk that we are not retaining, we have uh, multiple approaches to. Uh, what I, don't, I have done here is to separate it also very simply in a transfer to a second party uh, or to an acceptable second party. What I call uh, that is that, uh, for instance, when, I, when I'm signing a contract or an agreement, we have several discussions on uh, what we are doing, who is doing this, who is doing that, uh, what are your obligations, what are mine, and that negotiation in itself is a form of transferring risk and sharing risk between uh, the two parties. Uh, when I talk about uh, an acceptable second party, uh, if I was selling, I don't know uh, what, what could you sell? <coughs> tools, let's industrial tools, <laughs> for instance, yeah to a Senegalese company owned by Maurice Sa, I could, could be like, okay, okay I, I'm not very confident uh, that he has the, let's say, the financial capacity to pay me. But maybe if Maurice Sa, there is a subsidiary of, I don't know, General Motors in Senegal, to, to, just to take an example, I could tell him, okay, uh, well, we signed the contract, but I want a parent company guarantee from uh, General Motors. When I do that, actually what I'm doing is I, I'm taking a second party that I, rate more acceptable, and, but it is also a transfer to a direct, direct party because we have an agreement. It will be, for, for instance, a parent company guarantee. That's also what happens when, uh, instead of being paid directly, I require to have uh, instruments of payment, basically, for instance, a documentary credit, <laughs> which means that I will deliver the goods, but I will be paid by the, a bank in the country instead of the buyer. But I have a direct ag agreement with the bank too. So it is an acceptable second party. Uh, what I call a third party here is for the portion of risk that I do not transfer directly, uh, well, I can't keep it, or I can transfer it to a third party uh, that is operating in the risk, uh, in risk taking as its core business. So it can be a financial institution, uh, it could be a bank, they are doing that, or also an insurer. So that is where we come to the insurance market. So political risk insurance, if you summarize, is a form of transfer to a third party, uh, and the transfer will be done uh, with, uh, in the underwriting process with the insurer. So uh, a few underwriting specificities of the uh, political risk insurance. Because when you have that, you have political, you have risk, and you have insurance. Uh, and each of these terms uh, can convey very different things, sometimes opposite things. So what? Uh, the first remark is that uh, it is optional insurance. For instance, when I, if I come here and want to drive a car, I'm required to take, uh, let's say, uh, uh, car insurance. The basic uh, requirement is not actually to, to cover me from the risk of losing the car, car, the car. It is to cover third parties. For instance, if I run into the, let's, uh, a shop in Maxwell, uh, in Marshall Street, and I ha harm somebody, uh, the government or the state, the authorities, want to make sure that in that case, there will be, there will be someone who is able to pay. That's the same as if I'm taking, a, a, let's say, a building ins insurance, because if there is a fire, maybe I will not be able to pay it. So that uh, is, is uh, mandatory insurance, that part. But here is uh, optional insurance. If we keep the example of the car, uh, I could say, okay, my car is so nice and so beautiful that I would not want uh, some, uh, to have someone, let's say, uh, Yes, break it in some point. And I, 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 I can't go to an, uh, an underwriter and tell him, okay, if let's say someone steals my car, I would like you 
to, to reimburse me. That is optional insurance. So uh, I'm not forced to do that. Uh, so political risk insurance is in that second part, which is meant to protect you from a loss as opposed to protecting third parties of the harm you could, you could, you could make. Uh, it is a niche market uh, for enterprises. Uh, so uh, it is not that I just come up and uh, purchase political risk insurance for myself. So it is, um, uh, let's say, the risk that uh, the market means to cover is financial consequences of a political, and we will come back to that word, for, for, of a political event that is happening, let's say, abroad. Uh, or even in my home country, but we'll take, uh, talk about that uh, also. So as a niche market, it is very, very specialized because uh, as, as you will see, it is uh, costly. Political risk insurance is a little costly. Uh, companies, because they have also their uh, return requirements, internal re returns and whatever, they are not willing to put money outside just like that and maybe they will take the decision to cover it when they think that the contract is worth uh, paying the premium. So maybe they will do it if they think that the, the country where they are going is very risky or if the contract is very huge uh, and could have dire consequences if it is not performed or anything. But they are not electing to cover all their operations. Uh, another, another point, uh, if you are a US company, Maybe you will not be covering a risk uh, in Canada because you will say, okay, it's not home, but it's like home. But if I'm going to Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, <laughs> uh, I could say, okay, I'm trying to cover, I will cover that risk because I don't know. Uh, so we see uh, the challenge that is in assessing and pricing political risk because what, are, what is the limit? And as we have seen, uh, there is a matter of perception. Maybe, uh, to, to keep on my example, maybe a Senegalese company will be happy to go in Cote d'Ivoire without insurance because it is like home. But the American company will say, okay, no, I don't know, and vice versa. Uh, so you have the information problem, usually, uh, because uh, it's an environment that you don't know very much. It is very difficult, political risk is very difficult to mitigate or to predict. And just to give a few examples of losses, huge losses that happened in the market, uh, when the financial crisis started in Dubai, it was a time where risks were being priced very low and companies were like, okay, actually when we are doing that, we are just taking money, but uh, we are sure that uh, a loss will not occur and we see what happened. When we consider the Arab Spring, for instance, Tunisia. Tunisia was one of the countries that, had the, that was the most stable in Africa. And that's where it started. So it's very difficult uh, to predict. And you have per perception issues. Uh, then again, to take the example of the, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, on the market, for instance, uh, to compare Italian companies and French companies, uh, there was the loss in Tunisia, and losses in Tunisia and loss in Libya. But uh, Italian companies had been historically very comfortable in Libya and usually would not purchase insurance. And French companies usually would not uh, purchase insurance in Tunisia because they were uh, quite comfortable. So when the situation happened, uh, what happened was, was that the market had uh, to pay a lot of losses to, to Italian companies in Tunisia and to French companies uh, in, in Libya. So it shows you how percep perceptions matters and when you are talking about risk, so there is objective elements maybe, but there is a big part of it that is uh, related to perception. Uh, a few additional features. Uh, we are here on what we call catastrophic loss uh, insurance uh, as opposed to frequent uh, losses. Uh, Usually, if I take, uh, again, the example of car insurance, uh, if I'm an insurance, an insurance company, I will say, okay, I have, uh, let's say, 1,000 or 1,300 or whatever cars that I'm assuring. I know that they will be uh, running at this rate. Uh, so 
within a, a year or within a month, I will have that percentage of loss. And so I make a calculation and try to determine what will be my level, the level of the premium so that it is still affor affordable. But also, uh, I can't pay all the losses and still uh, retain money. Uh, in catastrophic insurance, usually, uh, the, the premium uh, is not in keeping with the, uh, with the amount of loss. For instance, if an earthquake, if I say, OK, I will cover an earthquake in the Syracuse area. Let's say it will, it will never happen. But if it happens, uh, if I try to figure out what could be the loss, let's say if all Syracuse buildings are wrecked, obviously I cannot ask an, an, insur an insured to pay that amount uh, in, or in order to be sure that if it happens, uh, it will, uh, I will repay him. So in catastrophic insurance, usually uh, the, the premium does not pay for the loss. And so what you hope and you expect, is our calculation, is also that, uh, let's say, losses will not be occurring uh, each and other day. Uh, and that will have uh, an effect on the perception, on, on the underwriting, on what, what risk uh, the market will be taking or not. Second point, there is a very high uh, concentration of risk across countries because there are not that many countries in the world as it were, as opposed to people, for instance, or houses or anything. So there is a high concentration. Uh, and maybe the, the, when you take a given country, for instance, US companies, uh, they have markets where they will be going, uh, let's say, regularly, and other markets where they will not be. So you have that concentration. You have a concentration of buyers uh, among countries so maybe it will be an authority, a public authority, the Ministry of Finance or anything, but uh, that buyer will be taking risks, uh, will be, let's say, producing risk, as it were, uh, of any kind. Because for, if I take the Ministry of Finance of a given country, maybe it will guarantee a, a, a loan to build a bridge. At the same time, it will guarantee something like that. It will be repaying. So you have a concentration of risk. And one, uh, let, let's say, a loss in one part can affect what you are doing without direct effect. For instance, if the Minister of Finance in Senegal cannot pay, uh, if I had uh, been, uh, if I was on a contract where I had a guarantee for the Minister of Finance, regardless of the fact that the non-payment uh, was produced, let's say, by a bilateral debt, I will be affected. Uh, the last thing is that, uh, is we are talking about lengthy and sizable commitments. Uh, usually, usually, but well, uh, underwriters will start to look at a risk at one million dollar and uh, and above, because uh, they have high underwriting costs and they want to the operation to have the size to support the premium that will be paid. And typically, there will be on 10 million operations. Or but you have underwriters, let's say private underwriters, that could can take up to uh, 100 million on a single risk. So for the period, uh, basically will be on over one year up to 15 years in general, depending on the type of covers. So when you underwrite, just imagine, when you underwrite the a risk on, I don't know, I change the country, on Japan uh, at 15 years, OK, maybe you, you know what will happen in one year or two or three. But what will happen in 15 years is anyone's guess. Uh, so uh, there are three types, uh, as you will note, but we'll maybe discuss that. Uh, I have elected not to go into the technical details of covers, but uh, that maybe we'll cover, but rather to see the types of covers and, may, and the general aspects. Of, of, uh, so we have three. Uh, types of actors, uh, namely we have the export credit agencies, so I, there is a list here, For instance, in Italy it is Sace, and uh, there are, let's say, usually public companies or private companies acting with a public mandate uh, that are meant to run a government scheme that is meant to cover operations. We'll talk about that later. You have uh, the private market, 
com comprise uh, with uh, the company markets, so insurance companies, for instance, Liberty Mutual uh, is doing uh, political risk insurance. Chartis, which is XAIG, or Zurich, or I don't know, Atradius, uh, Garant, there are companies that are providing political risk insurance. And you have the Lloyd's Syndicate, which is, which is one of the oldest market, and which is in, its, in itself a market. So when you're in the Lloyd's of London, so you have various syndicates uh, with class of risk, specific class of risk. Some will be operating in marine insurance, car insurance, or whatever. And some of them will be operating in political risk insurance uh, as, a as a class of their own. And uh, if you, you have the presentation, if you go to the, to the link, because there are, basically we could say that the market, if we count the d different load syndicates and the companies, maybe it is 30, 30 players or something like that in the private market. So it's not that huge, as, we, as you can see, and you can, you can have an, an updated list. In the list, it will be far longer. It will be longer, but many of them can do it technically, but are not doing it in practical. And you have also the multilateral agencies, such as MEGA, uh, Multilateral in Investment Guarantee Agency, or something like that, which is a subsidi subsidiary of the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank. You have ISIC uh, being a subsidiary of uh, the Islamic Development Bank or African trade uh, insurance. And also you have, for instance, as in the Asian Development Bank, sometimes they have political risk insurance schemes, but that they do not use very often because as they are banks, uh, usually they prefer to act with loans rather than with guarantees because uh, the return is higher, but they can do it technically. Uh, why talk about the three types of actors, because we have diverging uh, underwriting rationales. They are not trying to do the same thing while doing the same thing. Uh, the goal of the export credit agencies is to promote selected uh, overseas operations by nationals. For instance, uh, if I am to change, if I am the R R R Russian, for instance, credit export agency, I will say, okay, what I want is to help uh, Russian companies export, for instance. And so, if they are doing it, uh, let's say, if a, a, an oil company, Russian oil company, wants to, to go and operate in Nigeria, but would not do it uh, because the presumption of, of political risk is too, is too big, I say, okay, as the state, through the ECA, I will take that risk so that I allow my, my national companies to do that. So it is some, and sometimes even it is sometimes a hidden form of uh, helping, uh, helping for abroad operations with the kind of discussions you can have with between states. Uh, the private market, so <laughs> their, their goal is to make a profit, obviously. Uh, but it is in a highly regulated environment. Why? Because usually uh, when you take the insurance uh, market in a given country, uh, the states wants to make sure that uh, if someone is taking somebody's money to cover one risk, uh, one's risk, if the risk occurs, uh, he will be able to pay it. So as for the banks, you will have uh, various ratios to, to make sure that they have the financial capacity to do that. And also you have the, regular, the, leg, uh, the regulation aspects. For instance, if I am a, a, US, a US insurance company, uh, I will not be able to cover uh, uh, a given risk in Iran, for instance, because I am subjected also to the embargo by the US, by, for the US companies. Uh, the multilaterals, uh, their goal is, it relates to this one, but it's a little different. It is to promote selected operations in selected regions. Uh, what I mean by that, for instance, if you take uh, MIGA, which is a subsidiary of the World Bank. Uh, it has a uh, two categories of uh, countries, A countries and B countries. And it can cover uh, B countries being basically developing countries or emerging countries. And in its mandate, it will be covering also, no, only, sorry, uh, risk in B countries. For instance, France is a member, or the US are a member of, of MIGA, but 
uh, what it means is that U.S. companies will be able to benefit from, from the insurance, but uh, nobody will be able to cover uh, an operation in the U.S. or in France or the U.K. or OECD through MIGA because the goal of MIGA is to promote investment in developing countries. And you could say this, the same thing of almost all the, the multilateral, in, uh, the multilateral uh, insurance companies. So, uh, one common thing beyond uh, the diverging interests, you have uh, the sh a shared, uh, shared uh, underwriting constraints, uh, which means that uh, there is a limit to the appetite, risk ap appetite. Uh, that limit can be structural. Uh, for instance, if I'm a company, uh, whatever my financial capacity may be, there will be a limit beyond which I will not be able to take a risk. And for instance, if I take one, two, three, four, I don't know, different risk of 100 each, if they all occur, occur will I be able to respond? So you have that, uh, that aspect. You also have short-term capacities. That mean, for instance, there is a crisis in, in, in Cyprus, and I say, okay, I reduce my, my, my capacity there because I, my perception of the risk is higher. Uh, you have the reinsurance constraints because uh, one thing to say is that uh, all insurance, or all underwriters, insurers, they, when they take a risk, they uh, call, they uh, retain, that's the, say, the name, it's called the, retain, the retention portion. One part of the risk, for instance, if they underwrite 100, what they will do typically is, for instance, keep 10, and the 90 uh, remaining, they will be giving it to underwriters to reinsurers that, that are operating as insurers for the insurers. It is a, a way to mitigate the risk. So that uh, if there is a loss, uh, I pay, if you are the, the, the insured, I pay you 100. But as I had written only uh, 10, I will go to my reinsurance and claim, uh, claim the, the, nine, the 90 remaining. It, it, it allows to have something like uh, to mitigate the risk overall. Uh, well, you have the regulations, for instance, an embargo, and you have the risk appetite, uh, properly speaking. For instance, uh, I'm an underwriter, I will say, okay, these this are the kind of operation I'm willing to cover. Some will say, okay, I like ba banks, so I will cover bank loans. Others will say, I'm, I'm not covering uh, any operation where there is direct, direct payment by a private buyer. Others will say, okay, I want uh, let's say, Minister of Finance guarantee. And depending on the countries, maybe I will say, okay, if I'm covering a risk in China, I want it to be uh, in this reg region, but not in that, for instance, or I want the risk to be uh, taken on a public company and not a private or any, whatever. Uh, so they have their own uh, regulations. And you also have the underwriters, uh, let's say, personal experience sometimes, which is that, well, I don't feel it and I don't take it. It, it comes sometimes to that point. Uh, the second point is that you have intensive competition between, uh, be, between actors. So between same, time, same, same type actors, for instance, because I can't go to the private company A or the private company B or C, uh, but also across different uh, types of, type of actors. I can be a US companies, co company and I will say, okay, I will approach OPIC to see what they say, and at the same time, I will approach the private market to see what they say. And if the investment was, for instance, in the country uh, that is member of the Islamic Development Bank, maybe I will approach ISIC too to see what they say. So you have uh, intensive comp competition with, okay, you have to know what to do. Uh, sometimes market effects will make the company aggressive. We are, it is any, the end of the year, I have only one, one month left and I have not done my, uh, my quota, so I want to take more risk, for instance. But it's also a market where you have very uh, intensive cooperation. That is what is called usually a syndication market. So it is, not, uh, it is very common to have, for instance, uh, a risk of, say, uh, 100, to keep that, exam that example, and to say, okay, uh, I approach the market and uh, company A will say, okay, I'm willing to take uh, 10 
out of the, one, the, the 100. And another one will say, okay, I'm willing to take uh, 20. Another one will say, okay, I can't take this one. And we do it up to the point where we have the whole capacity. Uh, and the underwriters try to collaborate, or they don't, depending on their status. But usually they try to do it because it mitigates the risk. And they, uh, so they cover together the risk. And what happens is, for instance, if I have a loss, I will go to A and tell, okay, I have this loss, uh, give me the 20, and to B, give me the 10, and so on. I will collect, when it is done like this, I will be collect, uh, collecting the loss in every company. You have sometimes what they call fronting. Fronting is usually, uh, I, I go to underwriter A and say, okay, t uh, do you want to take 100? He says, okay, I can take it, uh, but I will take, uh, for instance, it's usually for banks. Uh, if uh, there is a company that is willing to take uh, the risk, but that has not a, a good rating. Usually banks, they take insurance, not for the cover in itself, but to reduce the cost of financing. So they say, okay, your rating is uh, B. Uh, uh, it will cost me too much. So can you find a, 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 comp a triple A company or double A company that is willing to take the risk? So what, what they will do is that uh, the insurer will go to another one and tell him, okay, you cover the risk and I cover you of the amount. They will make the agreement. So that the insurer, the insured, uh, he has the A rated company, but at the end of the day, the risk will, will be paid uh, by, the, by the B company to the, to, the, to the other one. And so, and other forms of, let's say, collaboration, you can find almost whatever. So, the type, last part, the type of covers that we have. Uh, here, I took it by operation. So, for instance, if, you, if you, we take an, an investment, uh, what type of risk are we facing? Uh, I'm talking about a foreign investment. Let's say I take an example. I'm a Senegal uh, a US company. That's more simple. Uh, I, I have to build, uh, I have to set up a company in Senegal that will be operating in a, in a mine, for instance. And I have a contract that will be lasting, an exploitation contract that will be lasting for, let's say, 30 years. And what kind of risk am I taking? Uh, maybe there will be a war at some point, and I will be forced to leave the country. Maybe I will be making money, but the, uh, Senegal will say, OK, we have a new government, and you cannot bring money outside of the country. Or maybe uh, it can be uh, whatever. Maybe there will be strikes, and people uh, will come and ruin my, 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 my investment, my premises or anything. So the main, what I call the mainstream co covers is what we can find uh, on a routine basis is what they call confiscation, expropriation, nationalization. Uh, to give an example, for instance, you have Chavez in Venezuela. He says, OK, uh, these US companies, they are exploiting our people, so I'm taking the, 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 the companies. Normally, if the companies are insured, they can go to an underwriter that will pay them back for the amount lost there. So you have what they call political violence. There is a war in Libya, and I was operating, and I have to, 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 to leave. So there is forced abandonment. But also, what I was doing, uh, whatever it is, has been, let's say, uh, disrupted by bombing. Uh, there can be transfer restrictions because uh, I'm operating somewhere, but my intention is to repatriate benefits uh, in my uh, home country, and I'm preventing, prevented for doing so. And you have occasional covers that can be specific to an operation, uh, for instance, a breach of, of contract, or if there is a bank that is do, making a loan to a company to allow the investment, and maybe it, it cannot be repa repaid because there is a political event, and so on. So one, the thing you see the most is cover for contracts, because there are more contracts than investment. And here, the risks are straightforward. It is the fact that you perform the contract. You start to purchase things, and it is interrupted for political risk. 
or you perform it and you cannot be paid because the buyer does not have any money or, or anything. Uh, so that is the kind of risk that can be covered. But also, you can have very specific covers. Uh, for instance, uh, I, you can, one cover we, we were having uh, was that uh, if you, you have a contract, for instance, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, and to, to, uh, you have to deliver sh shipment by boat, you have to go through the, state of, uh, the Strait of Hormuz, and it is not uh, exactly belonging to the country where you are investing, but you, you know that if there is a blockade, you will not be able to perform the contract. Another reason is that if you uh, sign a contract you issue bonds to the buyer to make, him, to make sure that uh, you will be performing the contract, and you have a decision by your host government saying, you, okay, you cannot go. So the buyer will call the bonds, and that is the risk that can be covered also. Uh, two last things. Uh, the one is the financial loans, financing and loan covers. So here, basically, the risk is uh, the non-repayment. Uh, you are a bank, you make a loan for, for an abroad operation. It, it is not paid because there is political risk, so you can go to the, to, to, to the underwriter. And you have also, for instance, on pre-finance -pre operation, where the bank pays the money, but uh, has to receive, let's say, oil, oil, a certain quantity of oil, for instance, or anything. If the contract is not performed, so the, the market, the insurance market, can, can co cover, cover that risk. Uh, the last thing here, you have mobile equipment. Actually here, the, the cover is r rather similar than what we have for investment. But we also have the risk of uh, non-exporting equipment. For instance, when I have to build, uh, I don't know, a, a plant. A plant. I, sometimes, uh, I, for instance, I had a contract in Libya where the equipment that the company had operating there was uh, for 150 million euros. So you have huge amount of equipment. It is highly specialized equipment, and that you are using on, over, over for different contracts in the world. And if they are kept in the country or they are, let's say, dispersed or confiscated, uh, not only you lose the, their value, but also you lose the possibility of uh, making other operations and maybe you will uh, sometimes be, ha have to face uh, the risk of uh, paying back the buyers, uh, the other buyers to, to whom you were committed because you cannot perform your contract. So that is basically what we can have uh, with the equipment cover. So uh, just to slide for conclusions, uh, when we consider the company uh, facing uh, political risk, uh, what they can do is renounce the operation. That is what companies do, do on a, on a uh, regular basis. They select the operation and they say, okay, if I have this contract uh, in this country, I will go or I will not go. And to select it, they will also consider the rate of return. Uh, they will say, okay, Senegal is fairly risky. I'm taking Senegal, so I'm not offending anybody. <laughs> uh, Senegal is fairly uh, risky, so well, I will not take a contract there if uh, the rate of return is 2%. But if it is 15%, okay, that I can consider. So they, they will be selecting the operation. Uh, second point, they will share and, ret and retain. They will be sharing a risk with their buyers, with the banks, and so on. And they will retain a good portion of the, opera of, of the operation. And there you have no, no rocket science. One example that was given on a classic basis on the, on the French market is you have Renault, Renault and Peugeot, uh, two car makers, and they had uh, different policies. Renault was like, okay, I'm not covering uh, any operation because I am, my operation has, has, has spread throughout the world and I, I, I am confident that, well, losses will not occur every time, everywhere at the same time. So I can take the risk of, let's say, losing something in Venezuela, but uh, keeping my operation. And Peugeot had exactly the opposite uh, position was that, OK, I'm too over the world. It's not my job to take that risk. So I will cover all operations that are not in the OECD countries, for instance. So you, you can have various approaches. The, the thing is that you, can, you have to be happy with it. 
And when you choose a transfer solution, that is where the insurance takes place, uh, because uh, it is the moment where you can find an underwriter that will be covering, let's say, risk of embargo, risk of a war occurring, uh, risk of, let's say, legal uh, discrimination or anything. So what use uh, for Maximilian, as it were? I think one thing, even uh, from a public administration perspective, I think that uh, it is important to be aware of political risk and the, the role it is playing actually in the, in the, in the investment or contract de contract, contracting decision. Because uh, companies will be considered, almost whenever they are going abroad, they will consider political risk. Maybe they will insure it or not, but it will be an important element in, in, in their decision to go somewhere. So what it means that there is a, party, a part of the risk that is hard to man manage even for a state because, uh, for instance, when there is a civil war in your country, it is not that you could manage it that much. But there are also the public policies that you are making that will be affecting uh, the perception of, of the risk. So that is something that is uh, to have in mind. And a last point, uh, it is a very diversified ma market because you have the national actors, uh, for instance, at the export credit, credit agencies. Uh, you have uh, international actors, uh, pub private companies or multilateral agencies. Uh, also, you have various types because you can be, uh, let's say, an underwriter working at an insurer's place, but you can also be a broker, which was what I was. So you are in, you are in the middle and you are trying to sell, as it were, risk to the insurance companies and to pre uh, present operations so that they take it uh, in the best conditions. Or you can also uh, look at it from a risk management standpoint uh, when you are in a private company or in a bank or something like that because you are having your operations all over the world and you have to, to see what you, what you, what you, how, how to do it. And a last thing that you, is that you also ha you have private actors and public actors. So it is something that is uh, very uh, large. It's a specialized market, but with a uh, large uh, type of actors, and that can be also one of their interests. So I'm done. Uh, what, uh, just last, one last remark is that I have not uh, insisted on what is covered, what is covered as a risk, but I think that is something that we can see if you want. Okay, it's good. First thing is yes, uh, insurance companies are affected, uh, especially when, when they work with banks uh, by their rating, because uh, you can purchase a cover for two reasons. Uh, the reason why people are doing it. it. One reason is that okay, if the risk occurs, maybe it will allow me uh, to be to be repaid. But another reason is to comply with, uh, so, uh, let's say, uh, constraints being that, okay, I need to have an obligation that is investment grade or anything. So if I'm taking a loan at 15 years, uh, if, I have, uh, if my risk is on, a, 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 let's say, double A rated insurance company, maybe the, the interest rate will be, let's say, 2% or 3 But if it was uh, on the Minister of Finance of the local country, maybe it will be 5 And if it was maybe on the private company, it would be 15 or anything. So when you put it on the other side, uh, it, it, so it, having the, the uh, let's say, the rating change uh, affects the company's ability to do business. And last point, it is taking more and more, uh, as, as any, any, any place in the world, there was a time, even when I started in the market, you had at Lloyd's, you, have those, you had the, those old underwriters that were in the market for 30 years, and they would look at your risk and say, okay, I feel it, I don't feel it, I take it like this. And with, uh, they could do 
almost whatever they want, wanted, and you could cover almost anything, provided that you show them uh, what is the risk. And, but now uh, the, the constraints are higher and higher. And so the second question just is that no, you, uh, you don't need a financial background, especially if you are a broker, for instance, because uh, you are selling the risk. If you are in an insurance company, you can be a financial analyst, for instance, for credit risk on private obligors. But uh, they will also sometimes look at people who have, uh, let's say, geopolitical background or history background. And you, usually it is, a, it is a market where people come from, from anywhere. You have people from the legal system for, because you will have a transverse, transversal approach of, of any given risk. Yes? Yeah. Uh, it, it depends uh, on the nationality of the assured, the insured. Uh, because, uh, for instance, you will have, uh, let's say, every nation, each nation is trying to make sure that its nationals, if they purchase insurance, uh, they can be paid if there is a loss. So if I am a US-based company, Sometimes I have requirement, requirements to go to a US, a US insurers, insurer. Uh, sometimes they say, okay, you have to go to a US insurer if it is available. If it is not, you can't go or, or, or outside. But the underwriter, he needs to have uh, to apply uh, for, let's say, accreditation. And he, he needs to have the, uh, an authorization to cover risk for a given, uh, let's say, com com company in a given company. Yeah. You could make uh, one of the links you have is the band union. They have, uh, let's say, a collective of several the biggest insurers. And they have their own regulations. But at the end of the day, it is, it is a, a, a country by, per country uh, requirement. You could uh, compare it more or less to what happens with the banks with a difference, which is that uh, the, the bank market is more coordinated. But uh, when you talk about an insurer, for instance, if you are a public insurer trying to help your company do, do business, you will take, be taking sometimes risk that you know uh, are pretty high, and you will not be pricing them at the, at the, at the, at the, at the good price, as opposed to if you are a private company. Uh, one last remark, maybe, is that uh, the importance is the fiscal imp implication. Is if I if I pay a loss, uh, for instance, if I'm a U.S. company, to take that exam example, if I lose money in Senegal and I'm paid by the by the company by by a company, will the U.S. Auto authorities consider that it is uh, indemnification for a loss, and in which case I will not have to pay, uh, not have additional fiscal charges on on that. Or will they consider that uh, it is just benefits that I'm, that I'm making? So if I had purchased, let's say, a cover uh, with, at a company that is not an insurer uh, in the US, in its legal status, if I receive that money, I will have to declare it, and it will be considered just like a, contract, uh, a contractual uh, gain, gain that I have. And I will have to, pay, to face charges or anything on that. But it's a national nation per nation, nation basis. The simple thing is that it's not that huge. If you take the private market, you have 30 uh, or some also actors, major actors. So they have an interest to coordinate. It is more a, coordina a coordination of interest than uh, a, a regulation once you go outside the, the national. The national. Uh, what? You're talking about the risk? The, well, uh, you usually, uh, if you, it depends whether you are talking about loans or contracts. Usually, uh, the value that is taken on contracts is lower than what is taken on loans. That's the first point. Uh, the, third, the second point is that uh, the period can depend. But uh, the biggest, there are underwrite, uh, underwriters that will be able to put up to, let's say, 10 million to 15 million on a single operation at two years. 
And there are other insurers that can put up to, let's say, 100 or 150 million at 20 years. And so it is very different markets. And what you do when you combine, uh, in practice, sometimes people, what they do is that they add the capacity of every, everybody. They say, OK, he can uh, provide 10 on this operation. She can provide 10. And, and they combine it and say, this is the market capacity. But that's not useful, because uh, usually you will not be able to gather all the capacity. Uh, practically, I see in my experience, uh, the risk, the risk we covered uh, up to 600 million on a single operation by, by com combining. But when you have 600 million risk, actually it could be a two billion contract because uh, you, have, you have your contract over two years and you have payments that are doing this and you have your costs that are doing this. And so as you are committing costs, you are being paid at the same time. So the, the risk that you have to cover is just the, the difference between what, will, what you receive. And so when you have a six, six million risk, it can be a two or three billion contract. But you are not covering a two or three billion risk. And if you had that, you would not be able to take it. Yeah? Uh, I would like you to come back to your initial question. Mm -hmm. This was in the first slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this concept is very new. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. It's new for me. Mm -hmm. So now that you have pitched mm -hmm. to uh, let us this concept, mm -hmm. what answer can you give to mm -hmm. this uh, problematic that you mm -hmm. um, Exactly. Uh, you have uh, different type of answers depending on the uh, on the the point of view that, 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 you, that you take. Uh, one thing is that uh, the political, political risk insurance is not very well known. And sometimes, uh, even when I was a broker, sometimes we would go to, a, let's say, an international company and talk to them about uh, political risk insurance. And sometimes they would not know, know about it, or they would know just a portion. Because you have some companies that are using it a lot, and others that are not using it. And many of them are not using it because they don't know uh, that, is, uh, that there is, uh, let's say, a, ma a market for that. So uh, one, uh, when you consider the, the decision to go to a foreign, uh, let's say, to invest or to contract in a foreign country, a developing country, uh, the first thing uh, the companies will consider is their ability to contract without, uh, without insurance. So, and, and usually uh, they will, if they are not comfortable at all, it is not common that they go uh, only because there is insurance. And one reason for that is that because uh, companies to make, uh, insurance companies to make sure that uh, the, the insured, they assess their risk cor correctly, they will ask them to retain one portion. So they will not cover uh, most of the time 100%. They will say, I cover you at 90%, 19%. So that if there is a loss, OK, I pay the most part of it, but you have a loss too. So it's not neutral for you to go and have a loss uh, rather than sit, sit, sit at home. So that is something that affects a lot uh, the decision, decision making, because you will try to make sure that you can perform the risk. And then you come to the part that there is the, let's say, the force majeure aspect of the risk. Uh, which is that, okay, uh, I have been operating in Senegal for 100 years, and there is a war. I cannot do a lot about it. Or there is a ch change of regime, and, and the new regime says, okay, no, we don't want any, any foreign company in, in here. And so that is usually the part that is meant to be taken. But in, pract in practice, uh, companies, come, they are taking more and more and more risk uh, when the market goes well up to the point where they are taking risks that normally are business risk, normal business risk. And when there is a loss, they just retract. And for instance, uh, they say, uh, you, you, you do not cover a burning house. So if uh, you come uh, at, to cover uh, uh, an operation on Cyprus, the day after there is the announcement that there is a problem there, they will not be covering it. And the result is that actually, political risk insurance will be helping make operations in countries where people would go, whatever. 
uh, two qualifications on that is that com companies want to diversify their risk. So usually you'll find at least one insurer or two that is willing to go wherever you want to go. And the second, part, the second point is that the existence of uh, export credit, credit agencies or multilateral agencies uh, is a, a means to, to reduce the, the correlation between the high risk and the decision to, to go because they have to serve other purposes, which is the reason why sometimes you will find even in very risky, as it were, countries, you will have possibilities to cover it from, let's say, this or that company.